Welcome to another video in SEG 2105. Today we're going to talk about requirements, what are they, and how to review them. First of all, a requirement is a statement that you find in some form of document that is agreed to by the customers and users, and the, and the development team as well. So it's a statement. It describes either an aspect of what the system must do, or a constraint on its development. And we'll talk about the different types of requirements in a little while. It has to contribute to solving the customer's problem. Solving the customer's problem is the central thing we're concerned about in software engineering. If it doesn't help with that process, that requirement should be dropped. And a set of requirements as a whole is a negotiated agreement among the stake stakeholders. Over time, they will change, the early going, there may be quite a few proposal, proposals for requirements. Some will be deleted, some will be edited, some will be added. The different parties, the different stakeholders go backwards and forwards deciding what should be done. Some are dropped because they don't solve the problem or they're going to cost too much, etc., etc. There are a number of different types of requirements. Of greatest importance, for most people, are the functional requirements. These are the requirements that describe what the system should do, what the results of the calculations will be, what the inputs and outputs will be, and so on. The remaining three types of requirements on this page are often called the non-functional requirements, although that doesn't mean they don't have a function. So I just prefer to simply call them quality, platform, and process requirements. So the quality requirements present constraints on the design to meet levels of quality. So for example, the response time must be a certain speed, the throughput must have a certain level, and so on. The platform requirements are also constraints. These constrain what language or what hardware or what operating system or development technology must be used. For example, if the requirements didn't state the hardware, a developer might develop code for Windows when it was intended to be developed for Linux, for example. So clearly, if you want a piece of Windows software to work with your existing Windows software, one of the constraints has to be that it has to be developed in Windows. And if you want a Java system to be made to work nicely with your existing Java systems, you might have a constraint that the new system has to be in Java too. Process requirements place other constraints on the project plan, the development methods. They might say, for example, that you have to use certain kinds of testing, certain kinds of modeling tools. So let's talk about the functional requirements. Functional requirements can be divided up as follows. First of all, we're concerned about the inputs. What kind of things can the user type? What should the format of these things be? What kinds of commands should be available? What kinds of data should be read from what kinds of devices and files? We're also concerned about the outputs. What kinds of screen displays should be created? What should appear on those screens? Not in the detail of the layout, that can be left to user interface design, but in general, what kinds of data needs to be presented to the end user? Storing data in a database as a third type of functional requirement, which can be both input and output, because you might be inputting data from that same database that you output into. In other words, the system might be doing updates. Then we have the computations. Now here we're not talking about lines of code, we're talking about abstract computations. Maybe it's mathematical formulas, adding things up, computing the average, computing some other uh, mathematical formula doing integration, doing differentiation if it's, a, if it's a mathematical system and so on. And finally, for many kinds of systems we're concerned with timing. The system must respond in hard real time in order to control something. So for example, in an automobile the, there's a hard constraint that you know, the brakes must work within a certain amount of time from the time they're applied. Synchronization Two things must happen at the same time, one thing must happen before another. So real-time systems, embedded systems, have these types of requirements, 
and we are considering them functional. Now let's talk about the quality requirements now. One of the things about all requirements is they must be verifiable. It's easy to verify the functional requirements. Is the output correct? Does it accept the input? Do the calculations get done the way we've specified? Is the data stored in the database as we expect, or in a file as we expect? But when it comes to the quality requirements, there's been a tendency to not make them verifiable. But we have to do this. We have to somehow put numbers on these things. So, for example, constraints on response time. We have to say that the web search must respond within two seconds, or the screen must refresh within a quarter of a second, or that when we type a key, that that key gets displayed on the screen, or the character gets displayed on the screen within one fiftieth of a second, for example, to make it look completely real time. So that's response time. Then we have throughput. Throughput is the number of transactions per unit time that this system can do. So for example, if we are processing a whole bunch of data, we're inputting a large amount of weather data and we want to compute a climate model, how fast can this occur? How many units of data can we process per minute, per hour, or a second if it's something that can be done fast. Then we're concerned about resource usage. Resource usage has to do with the amount of memory. We might say we wanted to use no more than a megabyte of, 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 of random access memory if it's an embedded device. We might say it needs to use no more than, than uh, 25 megabytes on a portable device, for example. Um, it can be specified in terms of random access memory or disk space. It can also be network bandwidth for transmission and, and reception. And there can be other kinds of resource usage constraints as well. Network bandwidth is, 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 can be divided up into a number of, of, of types. Reliability is another quality requirement. Mean time to failure is one way of measuring that. The average time between failures of the system where a failure is not just a crash, but where it gives the wrong result. Um, we want to calculate that. Or we can calculate reliability uh, in, in various other ways. Availability is often measured in terms of the percentage of the time an online system is up. If the system is up 99% of the time, that's called two nines. If it's, if it's up 99.9% .9 of the time, that's often called three nines. So a telecommunication system, a phone system, we want to be up very, very frequently. We might say 99.999% of the time, five nines, or even six or seven nines for certain kinds of, of, of critical systems. Okay, if the system goes down more frequently than that, it doesn't have the availability we want. Then we have requirements for recovery from failure. When failures occur, maybe we want to say that the, the, the data is preserved back to uh, the last minute. The last minute of data might be lost, but be up before that, no data would be lost. What are the requirements for that? What about allowances for maintenance and enhancement? These are sort of informal expressions that might constrain the design to allow for certain uh, enhancements that might be anticipated in the future. And then we have allowances for reusability. Okay, this is not functional. It's certainly describing quality, the reusability quality, but we might say that a certain percentage of the code must be reused, a certain percentage of the code must be designed to be reused, um, or, or particular pieces of the system must be designed to be reused. How do we go about gathering and analyzing requirements? Well, one way to do that is simply to observe users in practice. Okay, so we can read documents that, are, that, are, that the current users or customers produce and discuss the requirements with the users as we're reading those documents. We might watch important potential users as they do their work. So watching people enter data, watching people respond to clients, um, and we might videotape that and then later on ask the users to explain what they're doing. It might be manual processes we're watching that we're going to automate, or it might be existing computer-based processes. We want to see how they work. So for example, if I was taking an existing paper-based manual university system for dealing with 
curricula, keeping, keeping the curricula up to date and proposing changes to the curricula, I might watch the, the professors and look at the documents they're producing, attend meetings where curricula is discussed, where documents are circulated, and discuss the kinds of, of automation that can be applied to make that better. We can then go on to automate to, sorry, interviewing in a formal way. So we're going to select a bunch of stakeholders, users, customers, their managers, and conduct a series of interviews. There could be a whole book written about interviewing. Certainly there could be many lectures on that. This is a skill that you have to produce, but just a few quick tips. We want to ask about specific details as well as generalities. We want to really get down into the, into the depths and try and understand in some detail what their current process is, what they would like to see. But at the same time, we don't want the users and customers dictating details of the, the user interface or the file formats or the data formats to us. But we want to get a general idea of the, the, the kinds of constraints and the kind of, of, of things they want to do. We want their, their vision of the future as well. You know, if they had their dream system, what would it be like? But at the same time, we need to tell them that we can't build a dream system because it would be too expensive, but some of their dream ideas might turn out to be easy to implement. So we might implement them anyway. We might also want to ask if they have alternative ideas. They might have one idea that they've told us about, but there may be alternatives that they don't, they don't mention. And so are there any alternatives? Or do, if we have alternative ideas, what do they think of those alternatives? Other sources of information, other web pages, other documents, other people we could talk to who are experts or who could provide additional information for the requirements. And finally, it's very useful when interviewing to ask people to draw diagrams. Diagrams of screens, diagrams of process flows, diagrams of, of machines they use. Essentially, any kind of diagram, however informal, can really help us to get a better idea of how the system works.